Hello, this is Craig, and I want to talk about fantasy magic systems. In most fantasy magic systems, you choose your spell from a book, or a list. And that's fine if all your spells are is blow shit up. You don't need to have customized fireballs. Um, I mean, some, some games do, but there's very rarely much need for it. I decided that what I was going to do was build a system, a magic system, that allowed us to be a little bit more creative with our magic spells. And by that I mean both in terms of um, magic spells that do things in world that are not destructive, and in terms of being able to do whatever we want. So I've created this very simple showcase just to show you a little bit, the very, very basics, and I'm going to explain that now. This is the simplest spell there is. You draw it in sand or charcoal or any other substance and it fills with the mana of an element that is related to that. So if it's, if it's sand, it fills with air mana. If it's charcoal, it fills with fire mana. If this is triggered by someone stepping on it or by you pointing at it and being magic, then that mana enters the atmosphere with a poof. Um, and you get a spark of fire and a, and, a, and a bang, or you get a puff of wind, or you get a burst of dust. Whatever it is that the element is, it triggers a simple physics event. Uh, now, that might be too small for you. You might want to have a much bigger physics event. Well, you can do that. You can do that like this. You can see how the mana builds up as it moves inward, and then if you trigger the spell, this inner mana is what actually gets, is the final product, and that's what gets entered into the atmosphere. So this is much more powerful, something like eight times as powerful. And that explosion, or that puff of air, would knock someone off their feet, no problem. I actually went ahead and made a simple system, because that's going to be so commonly used I went ahead and made an augment system. Those are called augment circles. And this way you can get them nice and precise, but it's just a shortcut. A lot of spells you're not going to want to have an instantaneous effect. Instead, you're going to want to spread that effect out. Well, this is the way you do that. This is a subcircle system. And you notice that instead of being filled with mana in here, it's filled with mana in the subcircles. What this means is that when you trigger this spell, there is no instantaneous poof. Instead, the mana is fed into the subcircles at a very slow rate. The more circles, the slower the rate. There's no extra mana here. If you have one point of mana in the circle, then it just could spread out like 0.01 mana points per hour per circle, or something similar, depending on the number of circles you have and the amount of mana you have. So you get a steady effect. If you trigger a fire circle like this, you'll get a steady fire. If you trigger an air circle, you'll get a steady breeze. You just get an ongoing physics event that lasts for a long time. Well, in this case, you get eight very small ongoing physics events. But you can actually customize these, too. So if I were to do this, and then make this like this... Oop, too many. Eight is currently the maximum. If I was to do this, well, now I've got a physics event where when this circle actually ends, it's been feeding into this inner circle, and the inner circle has been collecting that and doling it out very slowly. So the inner circle has continuing, it can, has built up a battery. It is continuing to feed out. So when the outer circle fades away after an hour or a day or whatever, these inner circles remain and continue to process and can continue to move on for longer. You can actually break these apart and put different spells in each. So you can see that even with this very, very primitive spell system, um, with only two kinds of circles, you can still do a lot, and you can still have a lot of interesting things happen. For example, you could even just draw it in different uh, different kinds of, of elements. So this inner circle might be drawn in, fu in charcoal, and the outer circle is drawn in sand or something, and you'd get a different effect. It's just a very basic physics system. But this is not where the system ends. This is the very most basic part. Um, there are many other kinds of circles. For example, there's a scallop kind of circle, which only turns on when you manually trigger that particular circle rather than triggering the spell in general. So if these here were scallops, then once you triggered them, you could continue to trigger them to make the spell stronger or weaker as you see fit. And that would be independent from what's going on in here. So you can very easily create a system where you can, for example, 
levitate a rock to a certain height, depending on how many you do, and then you've got an elevator. There are a lot of other things. For example, the idea of uh, you don't see any lines here. There's no uh, none of the lines inside of the circle that you'd normally have when you're drawing these kinds of things. So you know, normally this would be a pentagram, right? But there's no there's no lines. Well, that's just because I haven't implemented them yet. Lines allow you to um, either take mana from something placed inside that circle, uh, such as a you know a mana crystal or they can allow you to take and put put the mana into something or jettison it, jettison it into the air or push it down into the surface of whatever the circle is drawn on. So those basic effects can radically change how you do your stuff. There are also a number of other things such as circles. If I were to draw a gear circle, an outer gear circle here and an inner gear circle here, I could spin the insides however I'd like. Uh, similarly, if you write along the side of the circle, then if you write something else, uh, if you write the same thing along the uh, circle in a different nearby spell, the two are linked. So if you've got this control system where you've got a whole bunch of scalloped control circles here, then you do the same array elsewhere and you label it with the same thing, you could control that from out there and that would allow you to control the spell remotely. You could have a big spell in your basement and turn it on and off based on what you do on your first floor or in your attic. Um, you can also swip, switch uh, circles out using a similar method where you have a labeled ring that has that contains a circle and when it's triggered it replaces a circle inside a similar labeled ring with the circle inside of it. It swaps the two. That would allow you to do a lot of cool stuff. Now, what I, there are actually some more stuff, but I won't go into any, any more detail. That's plenty. What the problem here is that, is that they're just physics events, and you can do a lot with physics events. You can create Minecraft, you can create Dwarf Fortress out of nothing but physics events. But what you can't do with physics events is stuff that's not related to physics. For example, you have a t-shirt. The shape of this t-shirt is not a physics event. Uh, that would be ridiculous. What it is, is you select from a list of t-shirts or sorry, I select from a list of shirts. You've got all these various kinds of shirts, and you know you've one of those shirts is a long sleeve dress shirt. Um, so if you wanted to, in the code of the game, you could easily change this into this, or vice versa, simply by changing which model is linked in. In terms of the game mechanics, this is actually done with a with a pseudo circle. It's not a real circle. It's not a physical circle drawn anywhere. It's just a control system that is accessible by the circle system. So this circles that are uh, that uh, circles in the same system which align are considered to be linked, and therefore this would be equivalent to choosing that shape, and this would be equivalent to choosing that shape. Now I have to stress this isn't something you're actually programming. It's just a way of thinking about something that is commonly programmed. When you've got uh, a list of available models and you're setting one of them to be the current model. So what does this get to us? Well this has a name. It's got text written around it. If the user can determine what that text is, then he can create a circle outside with the same text around it and rotate it. And doing so will rotate it inside of the shirt as well, and you will be changing the model of the shirt. So you can access this shirt if you know the secret name of the selection switch. You can access the shirt and change the model. And of course, anything else that's a similar sort of thing, like color, um, durability, any of that stuff can also be altered. How easy this is to find out, that's another question. There are circles which can scan for whatever is inside of the pentagram. They can scan for the names that are hidden inside. Those are difficult. And what it means is that if you are able to change what one shirt's shape is, it doesn't say you won't be able to change any other shirt's shape because this is unique for each shirt, this identifier. On the other hand, if, it's if, the, uh, if the circle is named 
in some manner, algorithmic manner, <laughs> you might get some hacker who determines that, and he's like, well, the shirt idea is 518, so therefore the inner circle is going to be... You can do that. That's fine, too. Uh, notice I haven't said anything about balance. This is, this is inherently an unbalanced magic system. I don't see anything wrong with that. This is not a destructive system, so there's no reason to worry about someone gaming the system to blow up other players or to flood the, to mar flood the market with super durable gold dress shirts. Um, that's not a concern, so it can be unbalanced. Now, uh, here's a trick. Uh, let me go ahead and explain how this normally works in case you're not aware. In most pieces of middleware, gaming middleware, you don't have, um, you know, you don't have a class game object which descends into a class, uh, you know, that descends into a class uh, clothes object, which descends into a class uh, shirt object, or that sort of thing. This is not how it normally happens. If you're doing it like this. Well, I can't say you're doing it badly, but it's a—it's not the standard way of doing it. Instead, your the way it is normally done in third-party middleware these days is the game object simply has a number of attributes, and one of them would be, say, a model, and one of them would be, say, a wearability uh, uh, stats, and one of them would be, uh, say, uh, inventory shape, and so on and so forth. Um, this sort of thing. This is ideal for what we're doing, because it means that all of the game objects share the same basic idea as to how they can be modified, and that means that we can modify them. So what we do here is we replace this with a slightly better not a different model, just a slightly more exaggerated model. So you have a game object, and the game object has a model, but it also has um, a valid model list. When a player learns the name of this, they are able to change that by creating a circle and rotating it in the game, and it will manually go and select for the next valid model list. And actually, this would probably be a single object. I'm just splitting it up so that you understand what's going on. But if the player knows the name of this, well then, first off, they can rotate it. That wouldn't do anything. It would just change the model. Same as if they knew the odd thing to this. But remember, I said that a player can switch out circles. If he knows the name, he can switch the circle with another circle using a, switch, a circle switching mechanic. So if he knows the name of the valid model list, he could clone the valid model list and store it somewhere. And then, when he found the valid model list of another system, he could actually substitute in this valid model list circle that he's cloned, basically an object, and he can replace the two. So if he has cloned the valid model list of a shirt, and he finds the valid model list of a fish, he can change the fish into a shirt. Now, how exactly you want to handle that is up to you. You can decide that it's a, just a fish that looks funny, or you can decide that the fish turns into a shirt. That all depends on how you have built this part of the game world. But fundamentally, this allows us to build a physics-based system that isn't physics-based. Or rather, it's a system that can interact with a physics-based spell system without actually relying on building everything out of physics-based events. You're not going to build you're not going to build the model of the t-shirt out of circles in the game world. That's ridiculous. You don't want to use that language. You want to use, you know, Maya or something and build a model of a shirt. But if you allow the player to access those models, then you allow the player a lot of freedom. And you have to think about exactly how you're going to do that but it does allow the player's spellbook to be arbitrarily large and to affect an arbitrary number of things. He could have a golem, he could build a golem which turns into a shirt when it's not in use. And I'm kind of being shirt obsessed here, but anything will do. He could have a golem that turns into, uh, you know, uh, an elf when it's not in use. That, those are, that's an elf, can you tell? 
There, it's got a bow, it's an elf. So, you can do all sorts of really cool stuff by drawing these images, these spells. And uh, you can also, of course, save the spells to a spellbook and call them up rapidly. You don't have to draw them fresh every single time. You can do permanent spells. Um, you can hack spells, because if the spell has one of these named circles in it, if you see that named circle, you can rem you can duplicate it, you can memorize it, you can put it in your own spell, and you can hack the spell. Now, can you imagine how much fun that would be if you were exploring ruins somewhere and you found an ancient spell? A huge spell underneath the ruins. You don't know what it does. You don't know how to activate it or how to work with it. But some of those circles are labeled. <laughs> Anyhow, that was the idea I came up with, and I think it's reasonably good. The physics all work out. Um, it'll take me a while longer to program them into the, geom the geometry physics all work out. It'll take me a while to, to finish programming them into this, um, but this is just a proof of concept to show you how easy it is to allow the player to build circles. They don't have to manually freehand everything or worry about that, and when they want to write something down, they would just click and say add text and write it they wouldn't have to uh, uh, you know, freehand the text. Oh yeah, and I forgot to mention, um, circles which are game world objects, you know, non-physics circles, uh, for example, the model, uh, the model list of a shirt, the valid model list of shirts. Those are circles, and they're special circles with a special kind of gibberish. So if you come across a circle with a special kind of gibberish, you know you've inherited something from the game engine. Anyhow, that's it.